All right, let's talk about Pushya Nakshatra. Now, it was originally called Tishya. Uh, um, yeah, it, eventually it became Pushya. Both names are great to use. If I use Tishya, you know, just know that that's, that's the same thing. And that was actually the original name given in the Nakshatra Sutras. All right, so <clears throat> Pushya or Tishya, um, it's, it falls around uh, 2059 or 21 degrees of Cancer to 3 degrees of Leo, around there. Um, and it, where, where to begin? It's really one of the luckiest, uh, of the nakshatras. It's one of the most fortunate. Rohini is the one that's like the moon's favorite, the best for growing, right? The best for growing everything, the most popular, the most likable star. But it's actually this nakshatra that's considered the most auspicious overall, the most fortunate. <clears throat> um... It's, it's really uh, fascinating because even in other cultures, like in, um, in the uh, like Persian and Arabic systems of astrology, this star and this, this fixed star is considered to be very auspicious. We'll go into that more. Um, but yeah, so Pusha, <clears throat> it's the, the key thing to understand about Pusha is that it's really the star of like worship um, and the priesthood. Um, we'll start with the sutra. It says, uh, Brihaspates Tisha, Juvata, Parastad, Yajamana, Avastad. And this is the sutra that they give in the Taittiriya Brahmana. And um, <clears throat> you could say the simplest way to um, translate this would be the auspiciousness of Brihaspati, the Tisha of Brihaspati. Tisha means fortunate, auspiciousness in general. So this star literally means just auspiciousness, you know? Um, but the sutra is saying the auspiciousness of Brihaspati, the, the priest of the gods, the teacher of the gods. The auspicious tisha of Brihaspati is Juvata, which can mean uh, like, well, it just means uh, you could say worshiping. Um, it it also can mean, uh, like, Juvata literally comes from the word tongue, which, because uh, worship was done by a flame in Vedic times, and a flame was, uh, like, the way you make a flame go to another flame, it, like, licks it. So there's this whole connection of uh, licking and the tongue to flames and Agni and the fire god. And uh, <clears throat> so it was like, Juvata could mean, this is what's really cool, is that the word Juvata could mean uh, like worshiping, but it also means um, like advisors, tongues, like wor like tongues as in like advisors, words of wisdom. I, the king would have tongues around to advise him. You know what I mean? So it's saying like you need advisors um, to get that auspiciousness of Brihaspati. And that's the idea is that Brihaspati is the 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 advisor of the gods he is the guru or the the you know the priest of the de of the devas he's the guru of the devas <clears throat> and he's related to jupiter as well just so you know so yes yeah, the auspiciousness of brihaspati is the <clears throat> worship from above and the uh worship per or you could say um the uh w yeah no the worshiper is really the best way to put it the worshiper from below so this is the nakshatra of worship and worshipers uh it's the <clears throat> it's the nakshatra of um you know priesthood uh devotion prayer church we're going to find it is the nakshatra of church in the modern days temples um uh religion dharma philosophy it's also the nakshatra of addictions if it's afflicted this nakshatra gives addictions <clears throat> because addictions come about when we aren't reaching our goal when we aren't getting to that fruit fruit uh blossomed state you know um it's the nakshatra of gurus of wanting to be a guru if it's afflicted or whatever you know you can kind of see more um <clears throat> kind of sort of like the Barani stuff where you get more people that are like kind of pushing too hard to be a guru or something. 
But uh, yeah, so one of the ways that we can translate this, I'll show you a few different translations of that sutra. Yeah, the auspiciousness of Brihaspati is worshiping from above and worshippers from below. Another one um, is, you know, the, the, for fortune to blossom, we need tongues for uh, worshippers or, or endeavorers or uh, actors. The Yajamana means um, the, the endeavorer. So, <clears throat> you know, that the point of that, what it's saying is that for, for you to get your goal, you don't just, you, you need to endeavor and try really hard, yes, but you also need the right guidance in that endeavoring, you know? Kind of like how in astrology, it's like the third, it's kind of like Mercury and Jupiter. Um, you need that Mercury to really engage and apply yourself and experiment, but you also need Jupiter to recognize, oh yeah, there's just people who just know what's best. And I should first go to them, let them tell me some good advice, you know, on these things, and then go about applying myself along those lines of that good advice. Um, for example, say you're like, oh, okay, I want to do nakshatra astrology, you know, you could spend like years, you know, like I did spend years figuring out all this stuff. Or you could just buy a course for $27 a month and get it, you know, or that's how much it costs at this moment. It might, that might change with the economy and everything. But, you know, you could uh, just buy a course and then just learn it all in a few months and, you know, kind of save yourself years and years of effort. And people who have afflicted Jupiters and Mercuries don't get this. And they just like, there are clients I've had who have try to study on their own for years and years and bug me about questions and then finally get a reading and I tell them all stuff and they're kind of let down They're like well I already knew all this stuff I'm like yeah of course you already knew this stuff because you spent four or five years this is your first reading I'm not going to blow your mind I'm going to tell you the basic stuff that I would you know that's important that I feel is important to you in this first hour-long reading and the point of this reading is that yeah, next time don't waste five of your years of your youth trying to figure out stuff that you can just pay a dude a hundred dollars an hour for and figure it out in an hour, you know? Um, <clears throat> that's the point of a guru. A guru just helps you get to your goal when you're stuck, helps you get there faster. So this is really the star of gurus and of pusha, of becoming blossomed, getting to your goal um, more quickly. Um, and you know, that's why it's a light and swift nakshatra as well. But we'll go into that more in a bit. But <clears throat> yeah, so it's really the nakshatra of uh, needing advice, needing tongues, needing, um, needing like to needing worship, needing to be around worship. And then that kind of manifests um, your endeavors, your worshiping, it makes that more successful. So that's kind of what that's saying. Um, yeah, so Brihaspati, he needs tongues, he needs advisors, he needs worship to guide the worshiper. Um, that's one way you can look at it. Another way you can look at it is that, you know, this star is all about blossoming, um, come bringing to fruition, blossoming our endeavors, getting the fruits of life, um, accomplishing our goals. And again, that's what also, so both these words are the same thing. Almost Tisha means something that has accomplished its goal. You know, someone who has hit the target. Um, Pusha means something that has accomplished its goals as well. Something that has been brought to fruition, but it's the same basic idea. And so to get that, it requires Yajamana, which Yajamana means the sacrificer or the worshiper, the person who's doing the sacrifice, <clears throat> the worshiper, the, that's the Yajamana. So it, this star has a, a, all to do with that. Anyone who's involved in in that in worship or being a priest or a medium for the divine or things like that, um, they'll have a, they'll be pushya involved. You know, like or like if Ketu's in pushya, they might have been a priest in a past life. But but yeah. So the idea is that you need. You need the juvata, you need the worship, you need to know how to worship, you need the, the tongues, the advisors, the words of wisdom. But you also need the yajamana, which uh, means you could just say the effort and the endeavors, the trying, the sweat, the kind of like ardra, you know, you have to put the work in. Um, and this is actually where the luck comes from. 
is that there's no real such thing as luck. There's just people that go about things in more in more naturally successful ways than others, you could say. Um, <clears throat> you know, like going to planets and stuff, like why is Jupiter lucky? You know, well, it's because he does things the wisest way. And so he just doesn't have to redo things so much and f doesn't fall into the natural pits that most other people fall into. But yeah, so Yajimana, effort and endeavoring, that's actually where that fortune is coming from. And so that's why Pushya is so lucky, is because it makes you a very sincere Yajimana, a very sincere endeavorer, a very sincere worshiper. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you get to be very sincere when you have the right truth, the right angle, the right advice on things. So again, when you have the Juvata. So it's all intertwined. Um, Juvata, you could say, is also like the study, the education, listening to your advisor, listening to your guru, reading the texts, um, and then doing all that plus engaging yourself and really applying yourself and doing the work. The Yajamana would, is always going to spell success. So like as a Kriya Yogi, you know, the Yajamana is actually doing the Kriyas and the meditation. The Juvata would be like reading the books, listening to Yogananda, reading the Bhagavad Gita, things like that, you know? Um, and you need to do both of those things. <clears throat> so, um, you need effort and advice, we could say. And uh, that leads you to Tisha, which is the literally just someone who is, you know, um, fortunate. And it also refers to the heavenly archer, which we're going to go into more in a little bit. I'm not ready to go into all that yet. It's so hard to, you know, oh, there's just so many angles I could just start rambling about. And I want to keep it more structured in order to teach you guys better. Um, so this nakshatra, any planets here will give, will have more priestly karmas related to them. If you have a lot of planets here, a lot of self factors, you're probably very more spiritual, more of a priestly kind of personality, even to your nature. People with the moon here are very sattvic, very inspired, very um, you know noble, virtuous people that want to do right, you know, do the right thing. Um, Jupiter here is really good because Jupiter is the lord of of Brihaspat, or you know, Jupiter is related to the lord of this nakshatra. And he's also exalted in Cancer, which is the majority of where this nakshatra falls in in this age. Jupiter here makes like just kind of like really good patriarchal good men in a sense who leave a good legacy for the world, you know, or things like that. Um, so in a Mahurta context, because this is ruled by Brihaspati, the priest of the gods, he's the pati, the priest of Briha, of becoming vast, of accomplishing, <clears throat> going very far. Um, yeah, because of that, it's really one of the best stars in a Mahurta context um, for launching, starting almost anything you want to start. Um, it pretty much always starts better under Pushya Nakshatra. This is likely because of a few factors, likely because of it, you know, it is it is light and swift, so it, it does things quickly and swiftly and accomplishes its goals fast. It's also up-facing, you know, so it mo makes things move up. So it's light and swift and up-facing and ruled by Brihaspati. So it's got a lot of, you know, desirable qualities to it, you could say. Um, and it has the Shakti to create spiritual energy, you know, which is, we all want that. So there's just a lot of like, this is just definitely one of those desirable stars, not like Barani or these other cruel and violent ones. And so anything, you know, you, you like really important things, uh, especially spiritual initiation, education oriented things are really good to start under this next shot. Yeah, now Pusha is said to have four different symbols. And this is again where it gets kind of... Uh, Again, I just think that over the ages and the time it's, it's kind of been embellished, it probably was just one symbol originally. Um, but yeah, Pusha has four different symbols. One is a fully blossomed flower. That's the most popular, that's the best kind of symbol, I think, or the most ideal, you know? It's simple, <clears throat> clear, does the trick. Um, you know, it conveys the idea of blossoming, of fruition, you know, of coming to success 
The other one is a circle. Now that's what's kind of weird. A circle doesn't really make sense for Pushya because there's nothing particularly about a circle that, you know, symbolizes being fortunate or accomplishing things or anything. And what's annoying is we already have Shatabishak is this symbolized by a circle. So again, why is this overlap of symbolism going on? Someone really, ugh, like just some, you know, we have to remember Vedic astrology went through Kali Yuga. It went through the dark ages, just like everything else on this planet Earth. India was not uh, exempt from Kali Yuga in the dark ages. And so a lot of corrupt, a lot of texts have been diluted or saturated or lost in translation or even corrupted by corrupt self-serving Brahmins. And that is an objective fact. If you're annoyed by a white man saying that, I'm sorry, but look into the history. There are many, many enlightened gurus who have spoken out about the corruption of the Brahmin caste. <clears throat> Not that all of them are corrupt, but there has been corrupt. I mean, there's corruption everywhere, you know? Um, so it, it's also in India, and so there's also going to be embellishments. Moving forward. So, yeah, I don't think a circle is very significant, just personally. I don't use it. Then... The udder of a sacred cow is another symbol. Well, I don't like that one either. I think that's just an embellishment of it falling in cancer, Rashi, you know, in this life. And it's also not the symbol, not the sign of cows. Ravati is the star of cows. And when we get to Ravati, it literally is cows from above and calves from below or whatever, you know. And so it's, it's the star of calves and cows. So it's not... No, an udder of a sacred cow is not the right symbol for Pushya. I'm sorry, but it's not. And um, this is what's also really annoying, is that Pushan is the deity of Ravati. Pushan is the same root, means the nourisher, the blossomer. Why is Pushan not the deity of Pushya, Nakshatra? I mean, wouldn't that make the most sense? That was what bugged me the most when I was first learning this stuff like a decade ago. And I finally learned what that was when we translated the Nakshatra Sutras, when Ernst finally translated those, um, they were just sitting there, you know, not being used by anyone, or there was these really terrible translations out there that were like r not remotely accurate. But yeah, uh, when we did that, and you look at it, oh, wow, it's originally called Tishya. It's literally not even called Pushya in the Vedic texts. Whoa, that explains everything. No wonder, yeah, it, it's not about push. it's not Pushya, and it's not related to Pushan because it wasn't Pushya. It was really Tishya. That's what it was originally. And it, Tishya is related to Brihaspati. So that makes sense. Um, so this is not the star of like nourishment and like a cow and like uh, like wealth and providing and all that symbolism. That's Ravati when we get to that. Um and it's just really important to not embellish it. This is just the star of like spirituality and accomplishing your goals, you know, and, and accomplishing all kinds of goals. Um, one of the other reasons why the udder of the sacred cow <clears throat> would be intertwined with this nakshatra is because <clears throat> there's this whole uh, legend, uh, one of the greatest rishis, Vashishta, who's essentially like a Brihaspati incarnate, he had this divine wish fulfilling cow. And there's a really cool story about that. And if, if you guys are interested, I could share that story um, about a king who encountered this cow and became obsessed with it and wanted to have it, but it was Vashishtas, and it goes in this whole thing. But basically, there is a cow in the mythology that um, can just, you know, fulfill any wishes from its udder, you know? And so when they go to attack Vashishta, the cow, an army of people just comes out of the udder of the cow and slays the people who are trying to attack him and so forth, you know? Um, so that leaves us with only one other symbol, and it's the arrow. Now, that's the, other, the only other symbol that I think is actually probably possibly the oldest. It's either the blossoming flower or the arrow. The reason the arrow is a great symbol for Pusha is because Tisha literally is the celestial archer in the sky, and that's what this nakshatra falls under. And literally, when you look at Pusha, um, when you look at this constellation that it falls under, it literally looks like an arrow. It looks just like an arrow. It really does. Wow, it's perfect. So, <clears throat> yeah, so although the arrow is related to Sagittarius and stuff, so it makes it more confusing in this era. 
I do love the arrow symbolism for Tisha or Pusha. Yeah. So either a fully blossom flower or an arrow are the best symbols for it, in my opinion. Yeah, so um, I do think that the flower is a good symbol for it. Uh, it's not, it's often seen as a lotus, but it's actually just any flower will work. It doesn't have to be a lotus. It's just any blossom flower is a symbol for Pusha. And yeah, I mean, the, the, it's the same root as push on. Remember the blossom, the fortunate, nourished, accomplished thing that has just successfully gotten to its goal um, and isn't withered, you know, like not like that type of flower. Um, and it's also kind of cool. Well, flowers convey this like, they convey this element of grace. They're also of the highest vibration of anything you can offer. So I think that's also a key part of why a flower is symbolized. This is the nakshatra of worship offering. Oh, that's another thing is it's um, offerings is another way you could take uh, take the um, <clears throat> the juhu that uh, the juva, juvata. Juhu is the root and ju like juvat means while offering. So it means offering, uh, you know, worshiping all these things, um, offering advice. So anyways, yeah, so uh, <laughs> the, 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 the flower is like the essential thing you offer in a worship, in a, in a puja, in a classic uh, Hindu sense of worship. Flowers have the highest vibration. They're the best things to offer. Um, yeah, fresh flowers. So I think that is also why Pusha is symbolized by a flower. Um, and I must say, yeah, like when you, if you have an altar or a place where you meditate, it's, well, I don't have any right now, but I try to put flowers up when I have time and just having flowers in your house, in your office, it really does imbue your area with this grace and this element of Tisha, you know, and fortunateness, auspiciousness. And then finally, we're going to find that, uh, yeah, Pusha is a Mula, Nakshatra. It is a plant related Nakshatra. So how perfect that it's a plant symbol. And so it is a very sensitive nakshatra in that regard as well. So that all lines up. That all fits very well. I forgot also to mention this. So the arrow, another reason why the arrow is a really interesting symbolism is that, you know, an arrow symbolizes attaining your goals, your long distance goals, which is similar with Sagittarius too, right? It's such an important star for, it's the, it's the sign of accomplishing our goals. But this is the nakshatra of accomplishing our goals. To hit the target is kind of the uh, the essence of, you know, fortunateness and luckiness. And, you know, yeah, again, Tishnu was originally called auspiciousness. It, or, you know, it was it was synonymous. And it was the, uh, the fortunate, the auspiciousness of Brihaspati, which is to say the auspiciousness of Jupiter. Jupiter owns the bow sign. So we can see this ancient connection here. And it very might be possible, it really might be possible that at one point in ancient times, this nakshatra was in Sagittarius. <clears throat> um, you know, it's it's very possible, yeah. So both Tisha and Brihaspati and Jupiter are all kind of related to the bow and the bow Rashi. Um, but what's really interesting is that Tisha supposedly Jupiter was first seen in the constellation of Tisha in ancient times. That's according to legend. According to just the legend uh, behind Vedic culture, yeah, uh, Jupiter was first seen and occulted in this, in this constellation or asterism. So that's really cool if so. And that would show the connection, right? <clears throat> and then even in a more direct sense, Tisha was the name of the celestial archer deity in the Vedas. So it's most likely the arrow that probably is the oldest symbol for this nakshatra and especially because it is the constellation that looks like an arrow and um yeah in the ramayana this being tisha appears to bless prince rama and he blesses prince rama in his attainment of his goal um he actually kills a rakshasa and then it frees it somehow frees tisha from some curse or something i forget i could read up on that again if you guys are interested and um yeah so 
so like he's disconnected to the ideal warrior, the ideal Kshatriya, because what the ideal like Rama is the ideal warrior, and what does the ideal hero Kshatriya warrior do? Well, he does what the he follows the guru. You know what I mean? Like he has a guru. That's the point of being a good warrior. Is not just oh I decide what's best and I'm self righteous. No, it's you follow a code, something above you, something beyond you. Like even like the samurai in Bushido. You know, you always have to have a moral compass, or you're not a real warrior. And you can't determine your moral compass because that's egotism. You have to have a higher uh, variable determine that. Which is why Mars and Jupiter are such great friends because Mars is the hero and he needs Jupiter to guide him, right? So that's why they're delight, they delight each other and why they're friends too. Um, so Mars-Jupiter conjunct in this next chapter, really good for uh, just auspicious, like for, you know, everything I just mentioned, really. Um <clears throat> But yeah, uh, Tisha is actually invoked along with Rudra and Agni and others in the Rig Veda for protection as well as for riches in other verses. Um, he's basically the archetype of the divine archer. So again, divinely hitting your goals, hitting your targets is what this nakshatra deals with. And uh, and I, I, as I wrote in the manual, you know, uh, the Tisha star field really does look like an arrow. And since Tisha was its original name, it's likely that the arrow was the original symbol. And it's made up of the stars known as Theta, Gamma, and Eta Can Cancri, or Cancery. Cancri. But it's, it's in what they call sidereal cancer. But what we know, it was never called that, you know what I mean, in ancient times. And yeah, they make a sort of arrow pointed shape in the sky. And it's really interesting because, like I was touching on, even in Zoroastrian civilization, they had a figure named Tishtria, who was also an archetype of the ideal heroic heavenly archer. And he was also considered the counsel to the gods, just like Brihaspati. And in Avestan astrology, this same constellation is considered the luckiest among all the stars. And some even say that, uh, yeah, Tishtria was later shortened to Tir, which was became the Farsi word for an arrow. Um, and then there is also even a Nordic god that's kind of connected with similar roots like Tyr or something like that, I forget. Um, really interesting, right? Uh, All right, so it's a light and swift nakshatra. So, yeah, as I previously touched on, this has got to be a reason why it's so such a fortunate nakshatra. So anything that you start under this star tends to work out swiftly, lightly, effortlessly, you know? And um, so it's great for travel, you know? It's great for, it's really great for most things um, as a result of that. Because most things we want to, you know, not take forever or whatever, most things we set out to do. So it makes you able to accomplish your goals more quickly and swiftly in general. And um, the, yeah, and then, you know, that's the thing, that's what's so interesting is that according to legend, Jupiter was first seen here. Well, the previous uh, star was a bow or Punarvasu, might have been a bow originally. It was either a house or a bow. That's what I think, you know, like I was saying. And then this may have been an arrow, then they would have been paired. Because in ancient times, um, you know, Jupiter was associated with both of these nakshatras. Just like how, um, well, yeah, for some, I forget the other ones, but I've gotten it written in the manual, you know, but like I think Venus was related to uh, either the Palgunis or the Bajrapadas, you know, these, these pairs of nakshatras. So it might have been that in ancient times, a lot of these nakshatras were paired up. Um, and it also kind of works because in like two nakshatras is like almost one month. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like a way to set it up as a month. Um, or just a way to like kind of section it off. But uh, yeah, you know, we have the two Bajrapadas, the two Falgunis, the two Ashadas. Well, there may have been others. And these, this one in Punarvasu may have been paired up, you could think of in ancient times. Because um, they... Well, not like they're the same, but there is something Jupiterian about both of them, isn't it? Isn't there? 